I, I've been trying to talk about Jesus this week. The one thing I've learned over this 53 years of living for Christ, 48 years of preaching this gospel, that God has one program, one theme, one message, and that's his son. Before there ever was a world or a human, there was this great God. And that God had thoughts, wills, and desires. And all of the thoughts, all of the will, all the desire of God was comprehended in that Son, everything. So he created you and I with one purpose in mind, that's all, nothing else, that through us he may reveal his Son. He didn't intend to make religious people out of us. He intended that his Son be revealed through our lives. God's only purpose in all of eternity is to fill this universe with Christ. Now, Paul writing said that Christ filled all things. Now, Paul always preached the church as complete. Faith has to start there. No matter where you are, faith has to start there. I have to know that God is finished before he ever begins. Whatever God planned is already done as far as he is concerned. So it's always, always a complete thing with God. And God's whole purpose of life in creating us is to reveal his son through us. He said you cannot preach him unless that son's revealed in you. He said it pleased God to reveal his son in him that he might, Paul said that, that he might preach him among the Gentiles. So God created us for that purpose. And if you fill everything with Christ, then everything will act like Christ. That's going to be the eternity. He is the righteousness of God. And the Bible says that there'll come a day when righteousness will cover this earth as waters cover the sea. That means Christ will be everything. <clears throat> and God has had no other purpose. The church is here for that. We've made it. How? What have we made the church? It is a disgrace to God, a misrepresentation of everything he is. But God's intent for it, us individually, that our life be Christ. That means that on that job where you work, in that school where you go, anywhere on that airplane you ride, that hotel you live in, you will create conditions of life because he is life. You'll create in that place. That's the test of Christianity. Not your ability to quote the Bible, but do you, by your presence, create conditions of life? Is that the way it is? You know, when you fly into Egypt, you're flying across that desert. You can look down. It's always clear out there. I don't know when it ever rains out there. But that desert looks like an ocean, only it's brown. Those sands blow in waves. They're out there. They move not like the water, but it's always sifting, always moving. Nothing living. But then you come to that river, that Nile. You look down, it's green, it's beautiful. That river in the midst of that desert created conditions of life and wherever the conditions are, something will live. And if you and I create spiritual conditions of life, people will live because of us. That's the message we preach. I want to continue that this morning. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, and I guarantee you that's the scripture. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11, that part of it, Paul said, Christ is all and in all. There's no mistake in the language. Christ is all. God said that through the Holy Ghost. Paul just wrote it down. Christ is all. Christ is in all. I, I just titled this, Christ, the Apocalypse of the Old Testament History and Prophecy. 
Now, you know the title a lot of times very important on a message. And I know that two-thirds of people don't know what apocalypse mean, so they'll come to find out what I said. But it means a revelation. Christ is the revelation of Old Testament history and prophecy. Nothing else, whatever else, any scripture you read in this Bible, wherever you're reading in this Bible, there ought to be this question in your mind, what has this to do with Christ? And until you know that, then you do not have the key to the understanding of where you're reading. The centrality and the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ is the key to understanding all of the Scripture because the Bible is a book about this Christ, nothing else. It all has to do. Paul said the law was a schoolmaster leading us to Christ. That system set in motion by Moses was a representation of Christ to the fraction. So God said, don't you change anything. Don't change, don't not move a door, don't change a color. See that you do it according to the pattern. Now, Luke 24 makes this very plain. There we find Jesus taking Moses, the Psalms, and all the prophets, and here's what he said, what they say all concerns me. He took those Emmaus Road disciples there also, and he expounded to them Christ from Genesis all the way to where they are, saying to them, this book is a book about me. That's what it's all about. Now, the progressive development of Christ's redemption, or rather the gradual discovery of that wonderful scheme of redemption that God has, is the sum and total of the substance of the Old Testament. From Genesis onward, God is developing in us his redemption, and that redemption is not a system, it's a person. Christ is redemption. God, the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 1 and 30, has made Christ to be unto me wisdom, sanctification, redemption, righteousness. This is what Christ is and what Christ has been made to us. Christ is then the key to the whole of this Bible. I never knew that for the first 20 years I was a preacher. I knew Christ saved, but I didn't know that. That. But when I discovered that, I read many times. I didn't know what I'm reading. Why am I involved with all these old kings and all this stuff of the Old Testament? You go through the Bible, through the Sunday school. Every seven years, you go back through that. But nobody knows what they're learning. David lived and died. If I never knew that, unless I knew he's connected with Christ, it has nothing to do with me ever being any holier than I am now. It's only as I recognize Recognize this book is a book. Christ unlocks the mysteries of the Old Testament, unravels its perplexities, harmonizes the seeming contradictions of that old book, verifies all its doctrines, fulfills all of its predictions, fill in the outline, completes its incompleteness, unifies, beautifies, and glorifies the whole of that new Old Testament. And unless you know that, it's an enigma. You just read and read, and you know what you're saying. You go through genealogies, you go through it all, you see the kings, and here is a Peleg, kill Meshach, and you've got, you don't know where you're going. But when you come to know that Christ unifies the whole, we're dealing with the person. The seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. That was a gospel for the first 4,000 years. He's a coming. He's a coming all along the line. Everything pointed to that. So in the reading of the Word of God, wherever you may be reading, the question should always be, what has this?
to do with Christ. You must not read the Word of God as history or a narrative or prophecy or anything else as a theme in itself. The question must be, what has this to do with Christ? Now you're on the key to knowing everything that God wants you to know. Because to know Christ, I believe that the greatest blessing of eternity is I'll be learning him for billions of years. I'll be learning Christ to know the love of Christ is the most astounding thing this universe has ever known anything about. And for all of those years, until you find what the portion of scriptures you're reading has to do with Christ, you have not found the key to the understanding. You just haven't got there. Example, when you read the book of Proverbs, if everywhere in that book it says wisdom, and it says as many times, if you just put the word Jesus, that book will come alive to you. And it's perfectly legitimate because the Bible said, God has made him to be unto me wisdom. And so as you read that book of Proverbs, just put him in there, every place where the word wisdom is used. Old Testament history was God's training school for Christianity. The whole thing was leading us to where we are today. The world had 4,000 years of practical education before it could graduate into Christianity. That's a long Bible school. But 4,000 years, the history is divine philosophy philosophy, teaching by example in the life of men and nation all the way through every one of those men. When you read the Old Testament, and you pick up on the men and the people that God has used to there, every one of them was marked by something. There was something about their life that they were brought there to represent. And when you think of those people, not represent and to be, when you think of, when you think of Moses, meekness, Abraham, faith, when you think of Solomon, you think of wisdom, when you think of David, you think of that heart after God. It's like God took one man and scattered him over the whole of that Old Testament. And when you bring him together, you have the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything was leading us to that. All of it. None of them could properly portray him all. Neither can you or I. It takes the church. But it is here. And we begin to understand God and come into real living fellowship with him. Now, everything in that history leads to Christ as all the rivers run to the ocean. Just as sure as they all run. Whether we can trace the course of these streams or not makes no difference because they all run the same way. Every last one of them, whether it be the great empires like Babylon, Assyria, Medo-Persia, or smaller nations like Egypt, Syria, Edom, Canaan, each has its lesson to be taught to us. All of it is a school leading us to Christianity. The, re what the results were that the world was ready when Christ came. The Romans built the roads. Everything had to be in place. But all of that history had to do with one person. And all of your eternity has to do with one person. When you stand at that judgment seat, he's not going to say, Duke, how many times did you preach? How much money did you give? But the whole question and the whole of eternity is how much of that son is reflected in your life.
life. No matter whatever else you do. I've told you in India how the silversmiths are on the streets. I give him some little silver coins, going to get him to make a ring for my wife. They look like we're there an hour and a half. He's got it in there, rolling that around. I said, how long is it going to take? He said, I, I don't know, but I'll know when it's ready. How will you know? I'll be able to see myself in it. God will keep you in the fire till he can see his son in you. Has no other reason for you living. But you be a reflection of that son. History is all about this son. And all of that Old Testament. Now, the intense, painful education of the past wrought out in the throes of suffering has struck home some lessons never, never to be forgotten. They're etched in everything. Had, had, a, had awakened a hunger, a sense of need that cannot be stopped. The results of all of this now had ordered all of this had ordered through providence a conjunction of national allotment and Pentecostal or political, excuse me, balancing to fit the moment when the Son of God should appear. Everything was working. History has no meaning apart from his church because the whole working out is that that son would have a bride. All the wars, the bloodshed, and the hell that's been on this planet has been allowed. God reckoned that it's all worth it to wind up with that bride for his son. That son occupies it all. Now, while all of this is true of the secular history of the Old Testament, it is especially true of the sacred history, the history of the Israelites. Those people that were forerunners, all of it a graduation on into the realities of God. You know, the chain of Jewish history began with the promise of the Messiah and culminated with the coming of that Messiah. Though they didn't even recognize him, yet the climax of their history was when he came. It all climaxed and culminated culminated in the coming of the Lord Jesus. Now the Israelite himself was God's man, was a living prophecy and promise of Jesus the God-man. He was God's man, but he was just the promise of the God-man that was to come. The firstborn among a whole race of people. Now the whole race had no other reason for its separate existence and special favors, but as a progenitors and forerunners of the Messiah, the world's redeemer. Israel had no other reason. They rejected him. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But their whole history was for one thing, him to come. Christ was to come through the seed of Abraham. Therefore, Abraham's line had to be a worthy line through which he might come. God separated him, called him out of the land of Ur, not just inherit a land called Palestine, but that through that godly line could come his son. All of that was in mind, nothing else. Every other law, every other covenant, every other thing he did was all pointing down the road when one day John would say, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The bright jewel of that messianic promise needing needed a fitting casket for its keeping and Judaism was set apart and anointed for that work that through that Christ may come all of it if you can see what I'm saying that all history is about the one that we sing about he's about the one whose name is above every name it's about the one that there's nobody else can save you everything nothing is separate from that those Jews and their Israel Israel 
Israelite nation had no reason to be on this planet but to birth the Lord Jesus Christ, to be that through which he could come. The glorious work of God's covenant for the world needed a temple where it might rest through the ages, and the Jewish nation was that for God. That's what they were. There's one coming, and everything else was in preparation for that one. And when that one came, everything else become history. Oh, my. If that just could take hold. If the church had told me that the day I was born, if I would have knew this book was that, I promise you I'd know more today than I know. I know because I know what I'm looking for. Amen. I know what I'm reaching for. I do know now when I open this book, I know what I'm looking for. There is no other program. There is no other person. There is no other plan. God's plan is his son the Lord Jesus Christ all the glory of Judaism is Christian glory you listen to me all the glory of Judaism is Christian glory their most distinguished men were those who most brightly reflected the light that was thrown back from the cross they are the ones that occupy the pages of this book their most illustrious national event were those that most strikingly presage the coming glory of the kingdom of Christ they were always looking Christ is the revelation the apocalypse of Old Testament prophecy as we just seen he was the apocalypse of the Old Testament history but he is of all of his prophecy the need for prophesying was that the coming Messiah seem long in coming now if you know that you just know why those prophets came you know, I, I preached from the 24th chapter uh, of the gospel of, of uh, Genesis. And in that book of Genesis, that whole 24th chapter is the getting a bride for Isaac, which is a type of the church and the bride uh, of, of Christ. And I say how far it is from that calling to that rapture, which it all signifies when she's in the evening time, saw Isaac walking out there in the shadows and she come down offered that camel to meet with him all of it is a rapture but there's nothing rougher I've never rode a camel but just a little bit in Egypt and and it's nothing rougher you got to learn to move every way you can't sit there and let the camel move and you not move you won't walk when you get off if you do there's nothing rougher hot heated and as they went along they'd stop that woman no doubt terribly sore and tired and she'd say to the servant I just can't get on that camel again and he'd pull out one of those big old golden bracelets with a diamond in it and slip it on her hand said daughter let me tell you this is just the earnest I'm telling you that boy's dad owns everything and he is the heir of it all now get back up on that donkey and let's move on oh hallelujah I can tell you that's what the gifts are all about they're not for idiots to play with they're whenever things going bad that jewel comes out God becomes real and I climb back up on ride that desert again hallelujah to God but if I lose sight of Jesus I'll quit there's not, a, not, not anything worthwhile. I said nothing worthwhile to keep going. You know, I've not uh, been in all that much, but I have been in places that it seemed like it had been better if I'd have never started. Uh, yes, the things that have come, and the things come against you. One morning, there's a posse, a mafia. They'd organized to totally destroy. You see, the devil knew that out of that church was going to come this school, that today,
today is in 104 nations of this world. He knew that. Well, that morning, right in the middle of the message, somebody give the signal, 60 stood up. Took them 10 minutes to get out. As they marched out, all hell had connived. I never missed a beat. I almost missed a heartbeat. But I preached anyway. I preached on. I could not have made it if I didn't know him and the jewel that's here. I'm not here just to have a church. I'm here to make Jesus real. I know him. I met him. It is in this revelation of Christ that causes a man to go. Paul said, the love of Christ constrains me. The need for prophesying then was what was that the Messiah's coming seemed long. They were great time. Many prophets and righteous men desired to see that every age hoped that the desire of the nations would come in their time. They all looked for it. Paul believed it. Abraham believed it. They all looked for it. Many prophets looked for it, but they did not see him, and the deferred, deferred hope made that heart sick. Amen. Amen. He didn't come, and their hearts were sick, and the imminent danger of despair and apostasy was averted by the timely appearance of those prophets. They didn't come just to give a record of history. They come along to let you know he is a coming. Amen. There's some things up the road that are going to happen, but he must rule until everything is under his feet, and they come along just at a time when everybody's heart's sick. He's never going to come. But all of a sudden, there stood a man on the horizon, a John the Baptist come out of the woods with a message from God, and a hope was renewed that he is going to come because everything else is useless unless he comes. Through them, God affirmed his promises through those prophets, listen, and renewed his pledges that Christ would surely come. Listen to this. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. Prophecy has only one mission, none other. That's to foretell Christ and his kingdom of grace and salvation, to preach Christ. Uh, uh, coming with all the warning instructions and hope which that supreme fact comprehended. There was never anything else for the prophet to do but to stir that heart again. Don't lose hope. He's a coming. Everything else signals that. You must always remember. The prophets were the Christian teachers of the Old Testament. They were Christ's teachers through the Old Testament. It, it's always there. They expounded, admonished, entreated, they warned, and they encouraged. All of them. Their teaching and their prediction intermingled and illustrated and enforced each other as you bring them all together. The compass of their preaching was vast and varied in its reach as a unity of their aim was emphatic and unmistakable. All of them pointing to one thing. There's one a-coming. And when he comes, the answer to everything is there. Nothing. Christ is all and in all. There's nothing outside of him. There's nothing anywhere outside of this Christ. God has nothing to offer. Once you have received God's Christ, you have the gift of God. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is how he come to live within you. Years ago, maybe three or four, I preached on this platform the proclaiming of, of the cross. I, I, I dealt with the proclamation, the preaching of that cross. And I talked about how that all of those long centuries, that veil of that temple hung there. The prophets prophesied, it hung. Christ came, it hung. The, the Sermon on the Mount was preached, it hung there. But when he said, it is finished, when he died, that veil was rent from top to bottom and God walked out.
out. I can tell you folks, there's nothing behind that curtain. You can run all across this country wanting to fall out, shake. You can run across this country wanting somebody to prophesy over you. But there's nothing but this. God walked out. And when you were filled with the Holy Ghost, you had received everything. Now it is learn how to live by this. That's the whole course of life. Nothing else behind that veil. When God walked out, that day it was all. Uh, like the modern preachers of Christ, those Old Testament prophets swept fearlessly through all regions of thought. They never left a stone unturned. You know, when you read them, really read them. Sometimes we read our, just say we've read. But when you read and you hear the voice of those prophets, you'll be amazed how they probed every human thought. They're all periods and dispensations of time through all worlds, physical, mental, moral, spiritual, all generations of men, through all motives, instincts, sensibilities of the human soul, but as a modern preacher's message is all summed up in Christ, so was those prophets. From Isaiah all, all summed up, I can tell you folks, there's nothing like this Christ. This is the answer. To know him is why you're here. Not to learn how to argue with people about religion, but to know this one and to know him well personally. He's mine. When the Bible talks about knowing him, it's the same word used in Genesis when it said that Adam knew Eve. There become a relationship there that's beyond human words to explain. And this is what their message was always. This link of gold holds all teaching together. Adios Christ holds all teaching together with a unity as complete and strong as it is beautiful. This link of Christ. Little wonder that many of the messages of that Old Testament are still wrapped in such deep obscurity. You know, you still don't know because they stretch far into the distance and the mighty developments of Christ that are still yet in the future. All of that portion of their message is full of strange and apparent contradictions which the advent of Christ made plain. A man reading, a virgin shall conceive. How can such a thing be? But the appearance of Christ did away with all riddles. Now I know everything is a Illuminated once you knew him. Listen to it. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel in Christ, that become the holiest and sublimest call or my of all the truths of the Bible. Luke 135, and the angel answered, said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Isaiah's Redeemer, despised and rejected of men, is Daniel's Son of Man. All of it became clear, coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He had no beauty, said the man of God, that we should desire him, yet he is a desire of all nations. He was despised and we esteemed him not, yet is exalted, extolled, and very high. Dying, he made his grave with the wicked and the rich, yet he's the everlasting father, and the increase of his government there should be no end. A child born, a son given, yet his name is the mighty God. Oh, what a Christ. What a Savior. If we could just come to know this and all of our Bible study could be considered in this to know Christ, no man can be educated better than that to come to know this Christ. When prophecy crystallized into history, these mysteries begin to vanish and wonderful harmonies of Christ's character stood out in wonderful bold relief. When, when it all comes, so will it be. The mysterious prophecies concerning Christ in the Old Testament still 
unfulfilled shall be the historic fact of the future. Then men can see Christ that cannot see him now, just as we see Christ as those patriarchs and prophets couldn't see him then. They uttered words that they themselves could not understand. There's no way that the prophet Isaiah could know what he was saying. Though the devil killed him for saying it, there's no way he could understand what he was speaking. The Old Testament is full of the prophecies of the second coming. We shall see him as he is. I think maybe 200 times or more in that Old Testament talks about his second coming. We will see him as he is. But whether it be prophecy of the past or the future, Christ and Christ alone is the object of every prophecy of this Bible. Nothing else is comprehended here. It all leads. It's disconnected until you come to know. Much of it cannot fit the puzzle till you see him there. And once you see him, I know what God was talking about. There's but one God and one mediator between God and man, himself, man, Christ Jesus. There's no other way to God, no other way to approach God. Amen. I, one of these uh, TV evangelists was preaching right on his program. And he said, oh, Jesus, I want to talk straight to the Father. Oh, what an idiot. There's no way to approach this. It is no other name under heaven. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There never was, there is not now, and there can never be. None. That's not bigotry. That's the truth of God. Now, Enoch walked with God, but his walk was a walk of the Christian faith. Enoch lived maybe 300 years after the flood. Adam is still around, and no doubt Adam told that grand nephew about the God that he knew in that garden. That's all he had. There's no epiphany. There's no visibility. There's no book he can read. But Adam said to Enoch, son, I want to tell you, I knew God in the garden. 300 years ago, he walked with me. Enoch fell in love with that God. He fell in love, and he walked with him in the darkest ages of this world. And he was not. You know why he could do that? He saw him. I said he saw him. He knew that's the object of our affection. Men love organizations. Men love teaching. Men love other people. But it's the love of Christ that's the key to everything. Noah listened to the warning voice of God with a Christian ear. Listen to me. With a Christian ear. I mean with a Christ ear. That's what I'm saying. And with a Christian eye, he penetrated far beyond the gathering floods to a greater ark of safety than the one he was building. Abraham saw Christ's day and was glad. Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. David sounded his greatest note as in the spirit, he beheld the ascending Lord. Listen to it. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift up you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. David saw him, and no greater psalm ever wrote. The saintliest Jew was the one that saw the meaning of the messianic promise, who lived up his best ideals that there's one coming. There's one coming. Judaism never was a religion distinct from Christianity. It had its only purpose was to bring the Christ into this world. The religion of the patriarchs was the dawn of the first streaks of Christian light. Judaism was the morning of the Christian day. All of it. And when they missed Christ, when they didn't know him, then their whole existence was wiped out. For this purpose, they were brought into existence. 
the first the blade, then the ear, then the full-grown ear. There was the infancy, the youth, the maturity. But it is Christ from the first to the last that all was in view. If Christ is a true God, then his religion must necessarily be the only true religion. No matter if Oprah Winfrey runs a thousand more programs trying to make you believe there's some good, no matter if Paul Crouch gets on that TBN and tries to tell you this good in all religion, he's a liar. I don't care how he wants to be or not, there is no good in any religion but this one. There is but one true God, and his religion is the only true religion, and if you don't know him, you are lost. There's no questions, no question. We were talking this morning about the baptism. Question asked, what about these? They are not the criteria. This book is the criteria. And this book, if you don't learn who the book is, God didn't give us a book, only give us a person. And if you don't discover the person, and when you discover the person, then everything is in him. It doesn't matter whether Mr. Graham or anybody else believes in the baptism. He believed in it. That's all that matters. No matter what anybody says, it's him. And when we know that, if Christ is a true God, then there's no other place to go. There are no morals outside of him. None. Everything you do is selfish. Oh, I, I preached on the total depravity of a human. I said the affections, all the affections of every human outside of Oh, I know people that just love their children, raise them right. I said, yes, because they're afraid they'll embarrass them. That's all. It isn't for the glory of God at all. The whole thing is, is I don't want them to get out there and dishonor me. It is, it's a selfish reason in everything that's not Christ. Everything. When he said, raise them up in the way that seems right. I've had mama come said I raised him up in church. I broke him there. Now look at him. He he he's he's a drug addict. He's this. You know when the Bible talks about train him up when he's right, he's not talking about that carnal nature. You can't train that up. You kill that. He's talking about get him born again and teach him the principles of this new life. I you you can raise him the best you can. But that's still our old nature. All the potentials of it are still there. There are no morals outside of Christ. In all ethical, spiritual realms, he is the blessed, only potentate. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. That means there's no king other than him. There's no lord other than him. There's nothing outside of him. He is all and he's in all. And when we let him be all, then our life is in line and if you let him live his life through you it's impossible for you to fail in this Christian life Christ is the truth and beauty of all the Hebrew types and symbols all of them did the manna fall from heaven as a daily bread of the Israelites then Christ says I'm the bread of life which came down from heaven and giveth light to the world amen did the water gush from the rock in the desert this book said that rock was Christ he becomes everything those symbols were he was that rock was a brazen serpent lifted up in the wilderness that the smitten Israelites might live listen to this as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life was there any deep spiritual significance in the high priest entering once a year into the holy of holies it was that the Jew might realize that he had a great high priest who should pass into the heavens. All of it symbolized there's one coming. All of this is but a type. Every sacrifice of the Old Testament was comprehended in the Lord Jesus Christ. From the burnt offering to the peace offering, from the meal offering to it all, every bit of it was comprehended in him. Now, no man can ever be a Christian 
or a servant of God in a real spiritual life and effectiveness beyond the measure of our inward apprehension of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can never go beyond that. No matter what you know, how smart, it only tends to pride. Only tends to pride. Unless it's knowing Him. That is the basis of everything. Of your life, of whether you walk holy, whether you live right, whether you're in that rapture, or whatever you are, it's all in the proper apprehension of who he is. Now listen to this. Jesus said, it's expedient that I go away. Those disciples are heartbroken. He's everything. When they're hungry, fed him. When, when they're sick, he healed them. When there's a problem, a storm, he shuts it down. <coughs> but now he's saying to them, I'm going to go away, and it's expedient that I go away, because if I go, I'm going to send you another comforter. He that has been with you is going to be in you, but when he comes, he is coming as the spirit of truth. Now, what is truth? Christ said, I am the truth. All the Bible teaching is to bring us to him who is the truth. And he said, I'm going to send the spirit of truth, and he is going to lead you and teach you all truth. The education now of that new creature demands the spirit of truth if it's going to learn. You can learn the Bible, memorize the Bible, and if you don't know the Christ the Bible, you're going to be mean when you get through because you're going to think you're smart and you're ignorant because you don't know him who's in the Bible and so you're going to try to force all this on somebody else but the spirit of truth has come to guide us into all truth all truth that is Christ I come to know him in his fullness and as I come to know to the measure to the measure I know him is a measure of my effectiveness I have no other effect. You, you may be the greatest promoter in town. You may be able to take up the user-friendly principles and fill that place with tares by the thousands. Amen. You may be able to do that. But the effectiveness of heaven in your life is a measure of Christ that you bring. To know him and to make him known is of him to live through you. It isn't talking to people about somebody that you never personally knew. I married my wife 55 years ago. She and I, I got out of the war. I met her. And I, I was 23 years old. She was 18. And it was, I, that's the first one in all those 23 years that I didn't want to get away from me. You know, I, and the only way I could get her was to marry her. So I married her 55 years ago. Amen. 55 years ago, I, I thought that I knew her. But you know, this morning I called her before daylight here. And when she answered that phone, I knew exactly what she was. I said, what's wrong? What's going on there? Well, you know this. You know that. I know her. I thought I knew her. I know her. I've been walking with Christ 53 years. I don't know him. You'll never in this world know all about him. But I'm going to tell you one thing. I do know him more than I did 53 years ago. I never majored in prophecy. I never majored in knowing who the Antichrist was. I got saved that night in that altar 53 years ago. I went in that 730 a drunk. I come out sober. Had five men working for me. On the way to work that night, we always stopped a little restaurant there all night because there's an oil field, place, little restaurant. We'd drink a little coffee, put two quarts of cheap wine in that refrigerator, drink for breakfast the next morning. That night, drinking that coffee, said, be no wine tonight, boys. No wine, no. Oh, four bit wine, you know, that's just cheap. <laughs> but it could, <coughs> I can tell you, it wasn't. It wasn't the kind these folks over these religious folks over here drank. <laughs> I said, no more wine. You know, you've been acting strange all night. They call me Tex. I said, you've been acting strange all night. Why? What, what's going on? I said, I got religion tonight. I didn't know terminology. Couldn't quote a scripture. Didn't know what born again was. Said, I got religion. One Catholic boy said, now, you know, Tex, he's older than me. He said, I've had that all of my life. Never act like this. 
but I'm born, see, born. And when I met him, here I am. You know, I'm going to quit. My wife told me, said, you got more willpower than any man I ever saw. Said, you quit seven times last week. <laughs> she told me one day, you know, I said, I'm, I'm going to quit. And she said to me, I, you're not lying, but you can't. That's what she said. You can't. First time in my life, I faced up to what it was. First time, I really looked me in the eye. And I went there that night. And this man I'm talking about changed all that. Fifty-three years, I've only wanted one thing, to know him. I, your prophecy is all right. He said, healer, he heal me many times. But I had one goal in life, is to know him. I was at the graduation of the school in Togmok. Middle Asia, the boys are going to have a test. I taught the last few lessons, 101 questions. They're all very nervous. They're very nervous, 101 questions. And the president himself is going to give this test. And the bishop got up and said, now, don't be nervous. He said, if you don't know a lesson, don't know it. He said, just write Jesus in every blank and Clinton's test, and you'll be 95% right. Fifty-three years, I just wanted one thing, to know him that saved me. Let us stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is the apocalypse of Old Testament history and prophecy. Every prophecy was fulfilled that day that John stood there. Behold the Lamb of God. The kingdom of God came that day. Hallelujah. How?